one, and we are recording. So, hi, my name is Garrett Lusco. I am tying here with Jay and some other guys, and I'm tying the, uh, what I call the GSP, or the Garrett Sculpin Pattern. Uh, so the first thing I do when it comes to this pattern is I prep the tail material. Now let me zoom in here. Okay, that's a tail. And so what I do is I take a, what I use is an egg hook, and that's what this is buried inside this rabbit strip. So try not to move it quite so fast and keep it close to your vise. That's so good. I do a, uh, it's, it's an egg hook, so it's not like an octopus hook or anything with an upturn or downturn eye, it's just a straight eye hook. And I loop on uh, some fire line which is, well, package is all ripped up, but it's 30 pound fire line and you can buy it at any local uh, fishing store. Uh, fly shops typically don't carry it, it's typically a gear material, so it's usually with a braid, but it's a tough, strong braid. And then this is just a standard size uh, olive variant rabbit strip. And I like the olive variant instead of the plain olive color because it has a lot of modeling and different colors and textures to it. So Garrett, how is that lashed to the rabbit strip? So I just tie it on. There's just a little tie-in point right here. I just use uh, Vivas 140 power it's thread. Just, it, in, in the hook shank itself is lashed to the rabbit strip yep. there? I poke the rabbit strip through the uh, point of the hook so it's essentially the rabbit strip is threaded on there and okay. then I tie it down for some extra security. It helps pin it back there so the hook doesn't break apart from the rabbit. Okay. And so that's the first thing I do here is it's all attached as one unit and I leave the rabbit strip nice and long. And is, then, is that a set length that you have there? When I'm tying production, I'll do a set length. It's usually about three to four inches. Just depends on how long you want your tail of your sculpin to be. And then I tie a nice long strip of this uh, uh, fire line. The fire line's fairly inexpensive. You get a ton of it for the price. So I'm not too worried about giving some extra length. Okay. Uh, so the next thing I use is I use the fish skull articulated shank in the 25 millimeter length. Uh, it, it, it's, there's no point on it, so you don't need to break anything off, and it gives a really nice tying base. And so the first thing I do is I put a thread base down by closing up that uh, junction point. These things are designed to attach multiple hooks, uh, multiple shanks or hooks together, so you don't have to use any kind of uh, uh, wire or any other kind of junction, it makes it kind of nice and convenient. So I put a nice little thread base down. Do you have to use super heavy thread for this or not? I prefer using uh, like a size 140 just because it uh, it gives me more confidence when I'm lashing down my materials. It is a streamer, so the fish that eat this aren't going to be taking it very lightly. So the first what, thing I What are you going to fish this for? Uh, it fishes really well for rainbows and cutthroats around the area. But again, any, any place where you have uh, streamer eaters, so brown trout, rainbows, uh, large sculpin populations. Uh, I know guys who throw this for steelhead. It's not a bad steelhead pattern, especially during the summertime when they've been in the river a little while. What about bull trout? I fish for bull trout, especially places like the Metolius or anywhere else where right. you can legally fish for them. Uh, so I, I lash that down. It's not tight right now. And the reason why is because I want to measure out a length of my body. How long do I want this sculpin to be? So you lash down the fire line. The fire line gets lashed down first. Okay. And this way I can adjust it in either direction. So if I want it to be a short, stubby little fly, I can go there. Or I can make it really long. So once you find the length that you like, and I would experiment before you make a bunch of them. I'd make a bunch of them at a different length. That way you can see where the fish take and what ends up being the best production. So I'm gonna eyeball it about that length. I like this size. It, 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 it's about two and a half inches, three inches from there. And I won't actually tie down that rabbit strip until the very end. So this is just to give me a size. So the first thing I do is I go down the entire length of the shank and I put my fire line through the eye of the hook and pull it back through. The reason for this is to add strength and I like an even body when it comes to my fly patterns. So I'll lash it down across the belly until it gets to the junction point there and then attach it up. And that's what, that's that's the first thing you do to attach the tail of the sculpin. So how do you like those moon scissors? They're good, they're really nice. They're actually, uh, I really like the fact that they're micro serrated on one edge and then just sharpened on the other. It makes them, it makes them really great. Uh, so the next thing I, I do is I add a piece of schloppen or a really piece of webby saddle hackle. 
Um, this is just going to be tied in in the junction point for uh, kind of cover up everything, kind of just start a transition. So once you pick out a feather, I like one that's pretty webby or very fluffy. It's kind of just, you kind of got to find the best of both worlds there. So I strip off all of the stuff that I don't want and I'm going to use that webby material and I don't need very much of it. I just need a short bit. So I tie it in on the, my side of the hook or the near side and then clip it out. And so then you're just going to wrap it across that junction point right there. This is just to add some motion and to kind of hide the junction. And that's tied in by the tip. Tied by the tip and then wrap backwards and a few lashes and then a tighten on it. Should hold it right there. And so then I do the rest of the body either with two different types of materials. The, the material I used all the time was this uh, dyed UV polar chenille and it looks great. Uh, it is kind of crinkly, but it, it's a, it's a great, great material. I've used it for a long time, but Hairline just came up with a polar reflector flash. So I've been tying a few of these with this, so that's what I'll do today. One thing you'll notice when you pull this out of the package and pull out a hank of it. So do me a favor, when you when you get a chunk of that, hold it by the shank and, and slow down a little bit. Yeah, so, so one see. thing you'll notice when you pull out of the package is you'll see how all the fibers are pointed in one direction, in this case towards the back of the fly. It's just like a hackle or anything else you're gonna wrap. You want those fibers pointing towards the back so it's one flowy motion. So the way I'll tie this in is with the fibers pointing towards the back on the top or the near side or whatever the most comfortable way you tie in materials. Does that come in different sizes? Right now it only comes in the one size. The polar chenille comes in multiple sizes. Um, I really hope Hairline does make a smaller or a medium or a large size to them. Uh, but you can always trim it. It's kind of the, because it's a synthetic, trimming it's not a bad idea. So this is essentially what your body's gonna be built of and this is gonna be your flash. So just, I polymer it up here and depending on how dense you want the flash and, the, and this body to be, depends on how tightly you wrap each one of these wraps. So if you space them out really wide, and barber pole it more so, you're gonna get a, a sparser fly. That's a great term, barber pole it. So if you do it really compact and tighten it like it's a chenille, you're gonna get a really dense fly and a really flashy fly. Uh, it's kind of just so you don't have to tie in any other kind of flash. So once I get up to about, it looks to be about two eye lengths away, I, I lash it off. Stroke everything back and tie it down. I go back over it a little bit just to hold everything back and rearward. So the next part is I use Senyo Fusion Dub and I keep all my dubbing on this little ring right here. So let me let me back out a little bit. That's quite an organizational system. Yeah, so you can go to any uh, like office supply store and you can buy these things. They're called binder, they're just binder rings but they're not attached to a binder. And so I have six or seven of these at home and they all have different types of dubbing on them. So I keep my fusion dub on one, I keep ice dub on another, I keep my hair dub and all other animals on a different kind of ring, different synthetics. It allows me to organize and I kind of organize it by color. So I keep all earth tones on one side and all bright colors on the other. That's cool. So the first one, I, I first material or senyo dub I tie in is red. Uh, you don't need a lot of it. A little bit goes a long way with this red, but essentially I set up two little bits. They're, they're about a wisp. I don't. I, it's really hard to measure this. Is that fusion dub or laser dub? This is laser dub. I thought so. I think I misspoke there. Yes, you did. <laughs> so yeah, so the you can use the you can actually use that fusion dub, um, but this is a long fiber and allows you to uh, stack it. So I stack it on on either side of the hook, almost like gills. So I do two wraps or three wraps to hold it into place, and then I do the other one. There's a method, uh, I've heard it called carding, where you line up all the fibers and then I twist it to kind of make one continuous piece. That way I don't lose a lot. Um, but then I tie them each on either side and figure them out and then I pull down nice and snug so I don't, so I don't get the fibers to pull out. The next thing I do is I fold everything back and in this case I'm going to wrap over it again. 
and then move my thread forward to my next spot. And this is where you're gonna start building up the head. If you notice these are really far back and they go a long ways back, I don't like having my, the gills that far back, so I tend to do an angled cut about the length of your uh, polar chenille or reflector chenille. So I can guarantee that the laser dove works better for this purpose than the fusion dove. Yes, and so there's two different colors you can use here of the laser dub. There's one called Sculpin Olive, which is a more of a brown color. It's closer to that. Uh, I've used it before, it looks good, but what I really prefer is the actual just true olive. I think it makes the fly look the best. Uh, this one you're gonna need a lot more than the red. So, so hang on just a minute. Hold, hold that corner of that bag up right by the fly. So it looks to me like what you've done there is You've got all your dubbing on a ring, mm -hmm. and then you cut a little hole in the corner of the bag, and you're just teasing out a little bit for each each fly? Yeah, it helps me with proportions and making sure I don't pull out too much. Okay. okay. It, uh, and, and what it tells me is which bag to use, because if you notice on this one, this is in my other olive, the corners aren't cut off, because I want to use this bag up first. It helps me make sure I don't use a little bit from all my packages. Gotcha. And I can just gotcha. kind of monitor my own, my own usage of it. Nice technique. So you're gonna take a hank. It's probably gonna be for each side. So whatever you use for your red, you kind of want to double it for your olive. So I'll put that amount, twist it, card it. When you say double, you mean twice as long? Twice as, as, as bulky. Twice I guess. as thick. Thick, okay. yeah. So I guess I tie a lot of deer hair flies, so I use uh, pencil thicknesses, so I'd use probably a quarter pencil for each of the red and probably a half for the olive. Or if you're tying this in black, you're going to want to use black, and if you're tying this in, in a, like a sandy color, sandy. Um, I've had guys want it tied in purple or pinks for steelhead. Um, so it just, whatever color you decide to use, just use um, double up whatever your accent is. And you don't have to add the red. If you don't like the bleeding gill kind of look to it, then you of course don't have to add the red. It's just, I like the look of it. So once you tie down the olive on either side, you're gonna lash it, cinch it, and then fold everything back. In this case, I'm not gonna tie over it. I'm just gonna tie in front of it. So the next thing I like to do is I add a sculpin helmet, but I wanna make sure it fits. So with everything on there and the helmet, everything fits right now. So I'm not gonna add any more dubbing. If for some reason your sculpin helmet is, doesn't fit at all, you're gonna wanna trim some dubbing away. And if, it, and if it fits and slides on and you still have tons of space before the eye, you might need to add a little bit extra. So this is kind of the point I look at before you get to the point of no return. Once you've tied everything off, you can't, it's really hard to add or subtract and make everything look correct. So I always like to double check real quick. The next thing I do is I tie two, the, two bits of rabbit in now. I, you have the tail and the other piece is I do it on the throat. So I flip the fly over, I have a rotary vise, so it allows me to do this. But I stroke everything back and I tie off a piece of rabbit. It's about, oh, I don't know, probably about half an inch long. You probably won't need all of that, but I tie it in on the throat. It helps give it more motion. It and looks like you picked a little bit of hair off the tip of that strip, did you? Uh, a, a tiny bit, but I like to trap everything in, so I try not to. Okay. This is really what this is doing, is to build up um, the empty space inside the Sculpin helmet. So that way when I add the glue and put the helmet on, it, uh, everything attaches correctly. So once that throat piece is in, it doesn't take a lot. Then you're gonna attach your tail. So the trick here, is not to pull it too tight because then you'll pull your hook up, but not to have it so loose where you have this weird arch. You kind of have to find this happy medium. So I keep everything nice and relaxed. I try not to pull anything too tight. And then I do a, one loose turn over this rabbit and I don't pull any of the rabbit out of the way. A lot of guys when they tie in rabbit, they, they pull it out of the way. I just don't like the look of that in this case. And I pull nice and tight, nice and strong down. I don't want this rabbit pulling out because this is the, the bread and butter of this fly. So I cut the rabbit off hide nice and tight. And then I'll trim up any bulk there and I'll lash it down. 
And so the last thing you do is you check the sculpin helmet one more time with everything on now. And if it's having trouble, you're gonna have to do a little bit of twisting and moving, but it should go on just fine. So once that sculpin helmet's on there, again, you're gonna have to take it off one last time. And I do a whip finish with a tool. So I whip finish, and it doesn't need to be a nice whip finish. It doesn't have to look good underneath there. You're gonna cover it up. It's one of the great perks of, the, of, of these sculpin helmets. So I use super glue, and I use Loctite in a gel form. What size uh, sculpin helmet are you using? So they have a mini, a small, and a large, and the small is probably the best size. If for some reason you're fishing really fast water, you're tying this in a really big size, go with a large. The minis don't weigh a lot. They maybe weigh a third of what these small helmets weigh. So you might, if you want to use the mini helmet, you're going to have to use a sinking line or something along those lines. So once I put that on there, that sculpin helmet won't go anywhere. I don't typically do a thread dam in front of it, but I do set it up like that. And the very, 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 very final thing I do is I have a comb here and I comb out the laser dub. And that pulls out any loose fibers and it kind of, in a way, unifies everything. Kind of blends it all together as one continuous piece. So Garrett, that sculpin helmet is just held on by the Loctite. The Loctite holds it on and it, it, Loctite does a really, really good job of it. It's, it's because when you add up all that bulk and everything, everything soaks in and grabs it. Uh, if for some reason you have any concerns of that coming off, which out of the amount of abuse I put on these flies, it hasn't. But if you do, for some reason, you can always put a thread dam in front of that sculpin helmet. Show, me, then, how, show me how a person would do that hmm. if, they, if they had to. If they had do, to? Do you have room to do that? It doesn't look like I have room on this one. Okay. I just, I don't normally but, a lot for that. But you would just start a piece of thread uh, right by the eye of the hook uh -huh. and build up a little bulk right there. Yeah, and you can either cover that with your normal head cement or your super glue or uh, UV epoxy and it, any one of those things. But what it does is right now it has a lot of it has a lot of bulk and that's kind of what you want in the Sculpin because in a real life Sculpin's, the way I've, they've been described to me are like shovels. They have a really big head and a really skinny body. Mm -hmm. So you want that bulk up front to push water just like a Sculpin would and then you want that tail in the back to whip around. So the fly ends up fishing really, really well, especially when swung. Garrett, that is great. Just do me a favor and just slowly rotate that so we can see the top and the other side and the underside. That is a great looking fly. Tell me again what it's called. I call it GSP or Garrett's Sculpin Pattern. Super. Thank you very much. Folks, I hope you enjoy this. Get out there.